ask everybody to come in, come into the sanctuary and stand up and enjoy, uh, enjoy some time of praise together. We're ready to start our worship service. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I can. To the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of But the word of our God stands forever. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold. They are sweeter than honey. Teach me knowledge and good judgment. Give me discernment that I may understand your statutes. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silence. 
It is good to see you all this morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, so glad that you're out here. Welcome to uh, September. Um, I don't know where August went, but uh, it's, it's flying. So anyway, um, so glad that you're here. If you're new or just joining us, uh, visiting maybe this morning, my name's Doug Betts. I'm the children and youth pastor here and just want to welcome you and, and, and hope you feel uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, one of the best ways, if you're new or, or visiting with us, if you'd like to learn more about us, uh, one of the best ways is, is in the bulletin. You can pick it up. There's lots of information about who we are, what's going on in the church. Um, and then at the end of each row is a friendship pad. I would, uh, if you would, pick those up and uh, sign those and pass those down the road. There's an opportunity. There's a place where you can, um, if you're interested in, in being contacted by a pastor, if you'd like to learn more about membership or baptism or whatever it may be, you can, you can mark that in there. Um, as well. And then at the end of each service, Pastor Dave, Pastor Clip, and myself will be at the doors. We'd love to visit with you, meet you if we haven't. Um, and as always, if you have something that you'd like to pray about, we'd love to pray with you also. Um, a few announcements that I have. Again, this information is in the bulletins. Uh, just to point out, the men's encounter is coming up September 6th through the 8th. Uh, if you have any interest in that, Max's contact information is in the bulletin. Um, and Max is right back there, so you can uh, visit with him, and he will uh, help you out with that. I know there's some guys maybe that are, are thinking about it. Tom Maxwell got up and spoke this morning and shared just a little bit about that. And Tom has been on me uh, for some time as he shared about the men's encounter and just a, a way to kind of light a fire in some men. He, he's been saying to me probably for, well, probably since CIY, Doug, we need, we need more men helping in fusion. And, and I, don't, I don't disagree um, so maybe if uh, God can light a fire uh, in you, then you can in turn light a fire in somebody else to, to pursue Christ. So I would encourage you to visit with uh, Max about that. Uh, other announcements that I have um, coming up uh, on September 25th, F uh, Fusion will join FCA at the school. We'll have an FCA rally. Um, I have uh, volunteered BFCC as the uh, food provider for that first night. We like to provide food for the students. Um, if you're interested in helping in any way, uh, providing food, serving, whatever that may be. If you have questions, um, I'd love to visit with you about that and just kind of see where that goes. Maybe if there's a, a small group that you have that would be interested in, in doing that, preparing, serving, whatever it looks like, I don't know, but I'd like to talk with you about it. Um, and then a few other needs that we have. Uh, one is Kids Church, which is coming up. We'll do that here in just a few minutes. I'll take some kids up. We do have one more need for a Kids Church leader. We had it filled, um, but then a volunteer had to step back, so the, the first Sunday, which is actually today, uh, is in need of a leader. I'll, I'll lead that this morning, but um, hopefully for next month we'll have somebody in that, in that spot. And then um, this one, and this is, this is on page 7 in your bulletin, uh, it's, it's a, a pretty urgent and, and important need that we have. I think we miss it. I don't know if you guys noticed this morning. I kind of noticed as we were shuffling in, we have a packed house again this morning, and, and it's getting harder to find some seats a little bit. Um, but that also means that the nursery and toddler room is, is probably packed as well, and, and that's an area where we have a need. We, we've actually, uh, um, we need 18 people to serve on teams to help fill that, um, which will, I think, make each person's individual responsibility a little lighter, um, but at the same time provide adequate service that we need, uh, especially for folks that are new to the church, that are coming, that are visiting, that have little ones, that are trying to um, get as much as they can and maybe have, maybe for a single mom, this might be the only real opportunity they have to spend with God. Um, we want that to be a, as good of an opportunity as we can possibly provide. So um, we do have a need now for 18. Two people have stepped up. Dave and uh, Patty Blackmore have decided to be part of that team. Thank you for that. Um, but we still have a need for 18 more people. And then we need a coordinator, which basically would be somebody to kind of oversee, help organize that if there's problems. Probably come talk to me, which is okay, but that's all good. Um, but it is, it, it's definitely a need. It's an area where, um, as you guys can see, like, we're, we're growing. This is exciting. Um, it's kind of cool to stand up here and look at and see all these faces. But, but I know that um, this is an area where we could use some help as well. Uh, so I, I really just want to encourage you. You can read about that on page 7 and, and the needs. But I really want to encourage you to pray about that. And if God is calling you in, in that direction to at least step step out maybe and have a conversation and we'll see where that goes um, kids church today so anybody that is in kindergarten through fourth grade we're going to go up to the fusion room we're going to talk about Cain and Abel today um, which is always kind of an interesting story um, 
But to me, I don't know, the, the, the main point of it is, is not necessarily what you give, but how you give it. And, and we see God reveals um, hearts, and he knows what's in our hearts. And so as we talk about the story of Cain and Abel, we'll see the difference between two hearts, one that was fully for God and one that was not so much. So, all right, thank you. In our legal system, in the U.S. courts, the uh, legal system has a task of seeking to determine what the truth is so they can either charge a person with a penalty if they're guilty or release a person if they're innocent. The courts seek to accomplish this in a fair and unbiased manner as best they can, and sometimes the courts do get it right, and sometimes they may not get it right. Jesus taught about a spiritual legal system for discovering truth, and to give us some background on our prayer time, I invite you to listen as I read about that in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, which says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth is will set you free. What can we learn from these words from John chapter 8? In this passage, Jesus communicates a very important truth, and that is, if you hold his teaching, you are really his disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now the Jews to whom he was speaking thought he was talking about physical slavery and freedom from physical slavery, but he goes on to explain later that he's talking about a spiritual slavery to sin. He said that if the Son sets you free from sin, you will be free indeed. What a powerful truth, and Cliff will be teaching more later today about how we can recognize lies and remain in the truth. We already have prayer, joys, and concerns that we shared in our earlier worship service, and we'll include those in our prayer time here in just a few minutes. But uh, we welcome the things that you would share right now, not only joys and concerns, but especially testimonies about what God is doing in and through your life and the lives of other people, whatever's on your heart. We want to pray together to the Lord as a church family about those things. What would you share as a prayer, joy, concern, or testimony? We welcome the things that are on your heart. Yes, Robbie. <laughs> That's great. We're glad to have you, and uh, uh, God bless you. I hope you have a good celebration together. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies. We welcome the things that are on your heart. Yes, Judy. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's a powerful testimony of God's uh, work, and we appreciate you sharing that. God bless you. We'll continue to pray for you, too, one day at a time. That's what we all continue with. The other, Back there, I see a hand.
Thanks for sharing that. That's an amazing thing. You bet. God bless you. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies. We welcome the things that are on your heart. I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a minute with a pattern of prayer following the letters of the word Acts as an outline, uh, A-C-T-S, in which A represents adoration or praise to God. C represents confession. T represents thanks. And S represents supplication or praying for others. I'm going to offer some suggestions as I'm praying, but I want to encourage you to pray on your own in your own heart, however God prompts you. Adoration. As we begin in our prayer time, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, worshiping him however you feel most comfortable. We do worship you, Lord. You are the creator, the giver and sustainer of life. You are sovereign. You're the Lord, the master, the ruler, the king, the almighty God. There's no other one like you. No wonder we worship you. No wonder we praise you. We lift our words in praise to you. We lift our hands and we lift our lives to surrender to you. Praise God. Praise God. Confession. As we continue on in our prayers, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart about your own life, however he prompts you. John chapter 8 reminds us, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I need that. We need that. We need the freedom that only Jesus can provide. We know we can't do anything in our own power to take away our guilt and to save ourselves. We realize we don't deserve your forgiveness. We can't earn it. We can't pay it back. It's only by grace, only as we receive it as a gift. Therefore, I confess my sins and I humbly ask for your forgiveness, healing, mercy, and cleansing. Thanks. As we continue on in our prayer time, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, thanking him for whatever he prompts you to thank him for. We do thank you, God, for this church family and the opportunity to share together on our spiritual journey. We thank you for each one because each person is special and unique and valuable and significant because that's the way you've created us. Lord, we give you thanks along with Eileen as she uh, shared the testimony of how you provided a dry way to get home when it was raining and, and uh, she thought she might have to spend the night in the car. Thank you for your provision. We thank you for Judy's testimony about having cancer and having uh, many people pray for her and then uh, receiving the blessing that she's been healed. Lord, continue to be with her, to provide for her, to protect and keep her, we pray. We give you thanks and praise along with Robbie that uh, most of his family is here and they can share together a special time of gathering and encouragement. Bless them, we pray. We give you thanks and praise along with Phyllis Shelberg from the first service as she reported on her cousin in Illinois that's had medical concerns. She's now able to take steps and is home. Continue to be with her, we pray. We thank you along with Renee Mason as she gave praise for support from the church and community for FCA and youth projects. And also a special thanks for our church youth pastor, Doug, and the good things he's been doing. Lord, continue to be at work in the young people and through Doug and those special opportunities. We give you thanks and praise along with Tim and Connie Hager for their 35th wedding anniversary today. Bless and encourage them, guide and keep them, we pray. We thank you along with Commissioner Howell and her son Vance. That she said that even though it was foggy coming in from Glasgow today, they were protected and didn't have any trouble on the road, no deer, no problems, made it even in the midst of the fog. Thank you for the testimony of Michelle Emerson that her husband Larry and her both appreciate the prayers for his health as he's had pneumonia doing much better now and we pray you continue to 
show yourself strong on his behalf to heal him and help him. We give you praise, God, for the Labor Day holiday tomorrow. And however folks are going to uh, recognize that, we pray it will be a special time of memory and, and pause to give thanks for those who work and for the many gifts and abilities that people have. We thank you for the men's encounter coming up this next weekend. We pray for those who are going and, and others that may be prompted to take the step to go be with them. We thank you for the new Young Adult Sunday Morning Life Group starting next Sunday, uh, September 8th. We pray that many be able to benefit from that. Likewise, for the new Financial Peace University Life Group starting Tuesday, September 17th. We pray folks would be able to sign up and participate and benefit from that. Give you praise for the plans for the upcoming Operation Christmas Child Program and for many people who will be blessed by the gifts that are put in shoe boxes. Supplication. As we continue on in our prayers, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, praying for others, however he prompts you. Lord, you're the one to whom we look. Some need your touch physically. Others may need your touch emotionally. Some need your touch relationally and others spiritually. <clears throat> in all these cases, you're the source of help, hope, and healing for all that's needed, and that's why we pray to you. Lord, we pray along with Donna Muncy for uh, some friends, uh, two different family groups that <clears throat> have uh, two young people who are in a difficult situation, need your help, need your direction, need your guidance. Lord, be with them and all that concerns them, we pray. We pray along with Jan Stauffer for safe travel for Ricky and Ryan House as they travel to and from Kansas City this week and this weekend. Uh, help them, we pray. We pray along with uh, others for Bonnie Steiner as she recovers from hip replacement surgery. Help her, we pray. We pray for Braden DePoy as he heals after leg surgery on a broken leg. We pray that uh, you'd be with him in his healing and recovery. We remember and pray for J.J. Pizzafred as he recovers in Kansas City after a liver transplant. It's the second time he's had a liver transplant. He really needs your help and your touch to be with him. We pray for Max Roberts as he has health concerns and need for healing, restoration after a stroke and eye surgery. Thank you for the recovery he's made so far. Continue to be with him. And we pray for the need for more folks to help with Kids Church and especially for the nursery worker volunteers that uh, need about 18 folks so that uh, people would only have to serve one time in a given month. We pray that you would prompt hearts to help with that. We pray for Pastor Cliff as he preaches today. Fill him, anoint him, use him, allow him to be a channel of your truth. And we pray your spirit would be present to prompt the heart of each one who hears that we may sense whatever the next step is for each of us. We're all on a different place on our journey, but we all have a next step no matter where we are. So help us, we pray. We pray for the families of those who have experienced passing of loved ones. We pray for the family of Tim Hager's brother, Mike Hager, whose funeral was last week in Topeka. Send comfort and peace to that family, we pray. Pray for the family of Shander Wagner's aunt, Sherry Neifert, as her funeral was Friday this last week. Send comfort and peace. And for the family of Jody Files' uncle, John Simmons, as his memorial service was yesterday. Send comfort and peace to all of them, but prompt us to be your hands, your feet, your words, to reach out and to support and encourage those who have experienced loss, that they may not be alone, but that we could share that with them. Lord, we do pray that you would remind us to be thankful for and aware of those who labor, those who have a variety of skills and abilities and much effort to serve in a variety of jobs. As we recognize Labor Day, help us to appreciate the difference that people make all from the power that you provide for each one to be able to serve in those special ways. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen.
while the deacons are coming forward, I just want to give some little word of instruction. So we're going to have a communion meal together. And if you're visiting with us, we welcome you here to Beloit First Christian Church. And we ask that you partake of this communion with us. All we ask is that you have given your lives to serve Jesus Christ, that he is your Lord and Savior. After the deacons pass out the elements, we ask that you please hold those, and then we'll take them together as a family. All right, I always ask you a question. This question is, what characteristic do we have that is unique only to ourselves? So what do you have that's only unique to you? Okay. Those of you that are young will say, well, our DNA, well, I'm too old. When I was a kid, you asked that question, and it was our fingerprint, right? Our fingerprint was unique to us. And it still amazes me that on a little tiny area of our finger can be unique amongst all the billions of people that there are in the world. But somehow that's true, I guess. So it got me thinking that if that's true, that we have only, our fingerprint is so unique, is it possible that we could have someone else's fingerprints on our lives? Um, so there was a, a, a song I love that uh, was written by a group of, of uh, prayer warriors at International House of Prayer in Kansas City. In fact, it was uh, Clay Edwards and Justin Rizzo and a couple other folks. And they wrote this song. It's called Fingerprints. And I don't have it up here on the, on the screen, but I just want to share the chorus of this. It said, you gave your life. Now I am fully alive. You spoke your truth and tore down all my walls. My life has a fingerprints of Christ, so be magnified through me. Wouldn't that be a great prayer, that our lives would resemble that of Christ? And I was reading in a, a book uh, by Jonathan Kahn, and uh, he talks about, because he has these little lessons he gives to people as you're reading it, and one of them is, what if God came to this little blue planet? Well, God has come to our blue planet, hadn't he? He stepped down. He's walked as a man on this particular world. And that life that he led was so radically different than everything else that it not only changed those people then, it changed the whole world. It changed history because of what he did. And so then the onus is then on us. If we are children of God, how can we reflect that? How can we do that? Well, Paul shared this in his letter to the Colossians. It's in the first chapter. And I'm, again, I don't have it on the screen. I apologize. It's a little bit long. It's about three or four verses here. And uh, so in this letter, Paul is telling the, the people in Colossae, he said, we are praying for you. And this is what they were praying. He said, we've been asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray that, we, and we pray this, in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may Please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Man, what a prayer. Thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Now, before you get too, conf too confused, Paul wasn't saying, do all these good works, and that's what's going to grant you that inheritance to live in the, in the family of light. It wasn't that. It's how we reflect God to others. We share our, through it our good works. But it says, the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. See, it's not about what we earn it's about what God has given to us, and that's what we're doing now. We're taking time to say, thank you, God, that you would care about us so much, that you love us so much, that you want to live with us forever, that you would give your son as a sacrifice for that. It's an amazing time. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity to just worship you and to praise you for not only who you are, but who you can be through us. God, help us to live a life that is worthy of being called a Christian, a son of Christ. Thank you, God. We love you, and we celebrate you this, at, on this time and on this day. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
So in the book of Luke, it's written, it says, and he, meaning Jesus, and he took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. A couple weeks ago, Robbie shared a video. Anybody remember his God's Pie video? Ah, so in this, the, the pie came, and the man of the house delivered the piece of pie to every interest in his life. And he gets to the end, and there says, God, but there's no pie. Crud. And even the German automaker says, dude, he brought the pie. Yeah, he brought the pie. So, now don't raise your hand, but who thought that that was a problem that that guy had in his budget? Anybody think he had a budgeting problem? Well, it really wasn't. What he had was a priority problem. He didn't prioritize his life. Once you do that, then you can budget. He hadn't even prioritized it. He lived out of himself. And so, we need to prioritize our life, don't we? So how do we do that? How do we know how much to spend on the house and how much to spend on the car and how much, oh yeah, and how much to give to God? How do we do that? We gotta ask, don't we? You know, Cliff even mentioned when he was on sabbatical that God shared with him, you gotta ask me. Not about the big things, yeah, sure, you've been doing that. Ask me about the little tiny things. And for some of us, giving to God is an afterthought. It's a, it's a little thing. And that's okay if that's where you're at. Maybe it ought to be reprioritized, but even then, even if it's an afterthought, ask God. So we're going to do that in just a little bit because we all have time and talents, and yes, we even have money too. We even have pie. And so it's up to God to tell us how to allocate that pie, how to allocate our time. So let's do that right now. Father God, we lift this time up to you. We praise you, and again, we thank you, and we give you all the praise, all the glory for everything in our lives. God, you are awesome. We never think we have enough time. We never think we have enough talent. And we sure don't think we have enough resources. But God, you've given us what you think we can handle and what we've shown to be true stewards of. So God, help us to choose wisely and to listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to you telling us what to do, how to live, and how to prioritize and to budget. God, we love you, and we, we give this all up to you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen.
Good morning, church. Uh, it is so good to have you guys here. I know it's a holiday weekend, so uh, that you would prioritize this time to be here it means a lot to us. Thank you for coming, uh, worshiping with us. Uh, I do want to get to our text for today, and if you uh, haven't uh, been here, uh, what we're doing is we're working our way through a particular book of the Bible right now, and it's called 1 John. Um, so if you have a Bible, I'd like to turn to 1 John chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, we always put the words on the screen here so that you can see it as well as hear it as we read it. Um, but also, this is a good time to just mention, um, we have Bibles ready to give to anyone who doesn't have a Bible of their own. Uh, they're out at the Welcome Center. Um, we love to give people their own Bibles. Um, and really what we talk about today is, is one of the reasons why, is because we want you to believe um, in Jesus Christ, but not simply because I say so or other people say so, but because you have read his word for yourself and you allow God to convince you through his word. So we treasure God's word, uh, the Bible, and we want you to have it. If you don't have it, just talk with us. We'd be happy to get you a Bible um, out at the Welcome Center. But if you have one to follow, uh, 1 John chapter 2 today, starting at verse uh, 15, and we're going to read through verse 27. And I'll mention just a, a few things after I read it of where we're at so far through the first chapter and into the second chapter um, to kind of get you caught up um, if you haven't been with us. But we are glad you're here. Um, just as I read this, follow along and remember, this is God's word. So listen for the Holy Spirit uh, to speak to you. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we ask you, as our Abba Father, the one who loves us dearly, we know, God, that we need to hear from you to really live. We need to hear your, your voice through the Holy Spirit, through your word. We've read it, but we do this a lot, God, where we read it and it just seems to, to not hit the mark. We pray that today your word hits the mark. You know each of un, one of us individually, so you know exactly what we need to hear, where we need to be challenged, where we need to be encouraged, and we leave that to your Holy Spirit. But God, we present ourselves as open, not resistant, even to hard truth. Whatever you would have for us would be for our very best, because you are good. And that's why we ask you now, in Jesus' name, amen. 
<coughs> so again, um, and some of you have read through the entire book of 1 John. Remember, we said it takes 25 minutes or so. So if you haven't done that, I would encourage you. But I've been very encouraged to hear many of you have been doing this. Um, and we've said when you do that, you'll see this theme that kind of rises to the surface pretty quickly, which is John is very interested in talking about what we know. And we said from the beginning, I'll say this many more times, when he says what you know, it's always more than just information or facts that you know in your head. It's, it's deeper than that. What he means to say is, how do you know by what information in your head, but also experience that you've had in life with God? How do you know what you know? And so each week I've tried to use that as kind of the framework for what we've looked at. At the very beginning, I said to John, uh, in John, uh, 1 John 1, tries to say, you can know, you can really know, not just in your head, but in your heart, that you have a relationship with the living God. Even though he's invisible, you cannot see him, and yet you love him. You have this real walking daily relationship with God. He says also, we said this a couple weeks ago, that in that relationship it will become very apparent quickly that God is holy, perfect, and you are not, I am not. And what do we do when we realize that we are sinners trying to have a relationship with the holy God? Well, because of Christ, we have a way in which we can confess our sins and we can receive full forgiveness. So the question was, how can you know that you're forgiven? You can know, not because of the strength of your repentance or confession. It needs to be authentic and genuine. But the real knowledge there that you are forgiven comes in knowing his character. He is the God who wants to forgive, who's made the way to, for, to have forgiveness happen uh, in your life. And then last week, we looked at the question, how can you know, how do you know that you're in Christ? It's kind of a positional statement, we said, that this amazing thing happens that the moment that you say yes to Jesus, that I receive your grace, your love, your righteousness for my unrighteousness, for the mess that I call a life, that there's this supernatural transfer that happens. You are given righteousness that's not your own. You are made right in relationship with God, and he sees you like he sees his son. He loves you like he loves his son. And so you can know that you're in Christ, and that has great um, meaning then for all of the struggles and battles that we face in life. It happens in a moment. It gets worked out in a lifetime. Today, the question shifts just a little bit here. Because so far in this letter, John, we said, writes his letters differently. Most of the letters in the New Testament, Paul has written that he would tell you exactly who he's writing to, kind of who's writing from, and, and the context becomes pretty clear in many cases. John, not so much, but we do get this clue today. I don't know if you saw it or heard it. There's something that happened in this church, or churches, if it's kind of a circular letter, Something's happening in the churches at the time, back in the first century. And here's what was happening. People were leaving. There were people who had been connected in a fellowship like ours. And at some point here, they began to leave. We don't know how many. We don't know how widespread. We know it was enough that John writes about it. And so when he mentions in verse uh, 19, 22, and 26, they went out from us. They went out, they did not really belong to us, and in fact, in their going out, they're also trying to do more than just leave. They're actually trying to lead you who are still in the church astray. So he's giving us some real specific things that are happening in their context in the first century that people are leaving the church. But it's not, um, it's not like happens a lot here, uh, you know, nowadays. Where you ever heard of church hoppers? Church hoppers are, and if you're like, if you are a church hopper, it's okay, we love you, we're glad you're here, quit hopping, but we, you know, the church hoppers are people who say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to that church anymore because I, I didn't like the music that they picked, and I, the temperature was too hot or too cold, and somebody took my favorite seat, and somebody took my last donut on Donut Sunday, and I'm done with that church, and I'm going to another church. Now, in this case, this is not church hoppers going to a better church in their minds. This is people who at one point said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I put my trust in what he has done for me. They said that at one point, and now at this point they're saying, no, I was wrong. Jesus is not 
the only way. I was wrong. I think there's something better than Jesus. I think there's something more than Jesus. And they were leaving the church, and you can imagine how unsettling that is. It, it's happened not just back in the first century 2,000 years ago. It has happened throughout church history. It happens here now. And it's always, of course, a heartache, isn't it? Imagine if one-third of us, I don't know, again, we don't have figures of how many, but imagine if a third of the church just left. And suddenly everybody who's left, who's remaining in the church is saying, gosh, I, we know them. We, we, we heard them confess their belief in Christ, and now they're saying they don't believe. And it's really unsettling at that point for everybody. And John, this elderly apostle, we think he's quite old at the time that he writes this letter. He's probably maybe 90, 95 years old. He has seen it all in his lifetime. He has seen this, this sort of thing happen, and he doesn't panic. And he doesn't say, oh my goodness, this is a, what, what do we, we better rally the troops, we better hunker down, we better set up the barricades and make a safe place just for us because it feels like we're, we're losing people, we got to just kind of, you know, we're going to have boycotts and, and we're going to burn some books and we're going to make sure that everybody stays together because we don't want to lose any more. You don't hear any of that. What you hear is John the Apostle say, you can know the difference between the truth and lies. You can know it, not just here, but with a certainty in your bones. You can look at a situation and say, how do I know if maybe they're right? Maybe there is more than Jesus. Maybe the Jesus that I've been preached to and talked about, and maybe I don't have the right idea of Jesus, and maybe, maybe there's a truth that I, didn't, I haven't identified yet, and how do I know? John wants us to understand I, this does still happen today. I mean, there, there's some recent profile, high-profile cases. Maybe some of you have read some of these with Joshua Harris was a, a believer, and years ago he wrote a big book called I Kissed Dating Goodbye, and it was a big Christian be bestseller book because he really espoused the biblical view of celibacy and, you know, before marriage and outside of marriage, and he, he really lifted that up. And Christians, of course, they were like, yeah, it's a great book. Read that book. That's great. And just recently, he's, he's basically said, I, I don't believe. I don't believe that stuff that I wrote. There's a high-profile Hillsong worship leader who also said, I, I don't believe anymore. And, and we love the stories. I love the stories. I've used them in my sermons, you know, of atheists who are converted, where God gets a hold of an atheist heart, like a C.S. Lewis or an Alistair McGrath, who at one point was antagonistic and argued against faith in Christ, and then God gets a hold of their heart, and the truth breaks in, and they become a believer. We love those stories, but we have to recognize and acknowledge the opposite happens, too. People who are in the church, and I believe, and then suddenly I don't believe. I'm not sure I believe. I don't think there's a way to maybe even to know the truth, but John says there is. You can really know the difference between truth and lies, and you can remain in the truth. How? Well, he starts off, and I, there's really two things here. He wants to, I, I think he's trying to show us where lies come from. Two, in a very general way, two places where lies are going to come from. And the first one is a little surprising when we're thinking about it because I think we overlook this. John doesn't, though. Look at verses 15 and 17, through 17. It's an odd way that he puts it, but this is what he's driving at. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them, for everything in the world, and then he does define what it means when he says the love of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world, and the world and its desires pass away. One of the most amazing things to me when I first became a Christian was when I first accepted Christ, I thought I, and I really did, I, I knew I was a sinner. I knew my sin ran deeper than, you know, just I messed up a couple times. No, I'm, there's something fundamentally where I don't trust God and I, I don't believe in God and I, I'm a sinner and I need the grace of God to break through that. But I thought I really understood how bad of a sinner I was when I first accepted Christ. And I want to tell you, I'm 55 years old now, so I've been a Christian for a while. I had no idea how deep my sin runs. None. Now, I have a better appreciation. 
I was really appreciative when I first accepted Christ at age 14 to say, Jesus died for my sins. And of course, the only sins I had in mind were all the sins I had committed in 14 years of being alive on this planet. I thought, man, that's, that's a lot of sins. I mean, look at my life, and I could spell them out to you. Now I've been alive 55 years, I'm like, there's a lot more sins that he died for I wasn't even aware back then. And not only the number, but the depth that it goes in me. You become more and more aware of what's going on inside of you the longer you walk with Jesus. And it's not always pretty, but it's true. It's truth. So C.S. Lewis puts it this way. The right direction, when you're going in the right direction, leads not only to peace, we all want that, just a peace in my mind and my heart, it also leads to knowledge. So he says, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. And when a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. And he says, this is actually common sense. You understand sleep when you're awake, not when you're sleeping. He says, you can understand the nature of drunkenness, not when you are drunk, but when you are sober. And in the same way, he says, for the Christian, the Christian life, what we talk about is you begin to only understand your sin when we are made right in Christ and renewed in righteousness. You know your sin goes a lot deeper than you first thought the more you walk with Jesus. It doesn't bring you to despair. It doesn't make you give up. It actually grows your gratitude. I thought I knew how bad I was. I'm only beginning to touch, to understand that, but God already knew. So the point here is this. When John says, don't love the world or anything in the world, he's saying, before we talk about lies that are out there, people trying to deceive you and lead you astray, recognize that there are many days that you and I don't even need the devil's help, do we? that I have lies pumping out of my own heart that I believe. In fact, I believe my lies way quicker than I believe almost anybody else's because there's part of me that's built in this old sinful nature that says, and that's what John means when he says the world. That's why he defined it for us. He says, what's the world? It's this lust of the flesh. It means when I say world, he says there's three ways in which I can use the term world. He says, don't love the world. Wait a second, that sounds weird. John, I even remember in your gospel, you have a verse that says, for God so loved the world. Aren't we supposed to love the world? God does. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. John, what are you saying? He's saying, no, that's a different way in which I use the word. There's one way that says it means the creation itself, which God declared good when he made it. There's another way in which he means people. The world means people. That's where John 3.16, God so loved people, human beings. God so loved the world. But there's a third sense, he said, of this word, the world, that is not any of those two. It means your sinful nature. It means the cravings of this flesh. When he says the cravings of the flesh, it's another word for sinful nature within us. He's saying, don't you realize from the day you're born, there's a part of you that says to God, hands off. I don't want anybody telling me how to live my life. And that seems so natural to us. Why? Because we're born with that. We're born with a sinful nature. And the lie part of it, when John says, don't love the world, what he's saying is, don't love any person or thing in such a way that it basically becomes a substitute for God. If you do that, you're not living the truth. You're actually living a lie. You're lying to yourself in this way. You're saying, gosh, if only... Look, if I can just get to the next level of success, whether that's in athletics or whether it's with my job or whether it's with some hobby that I've got, if I can just get to the next level, be successful, where people recognize, man, you're really good at that, then I will be fulfilled. And John is saying, you are loving success, that's a thing of the world, more than God. And it's a lie. He says, why it's a lie? Because those desires will pass. They never last. You get to that next level, and you think, now I'm fulfilled. I got what I wanted, except it really doesn't fulfill. Ask any athlete who has ever conquered at some point, whether it's the Super Bowl, whether it's the World Series, whether it's whatever it is, and they finally get to that final ultimate point of their career, and they say, I got it. 
And you hear this over and over and over again. They're like, yeah, and then it passed away. And I'm driven to get it again, but at a higher level. John says that's what happens when you love the world. Your sinful nature is saying, I don't need God because if I have this success, I'll be fulfilled. I don't need God because if I could just get this person to be attracted to me, I know I would feel really good about myself. I would be secure in my identity. And in that moment, we're lying to ourselves. John says, you're, you're loving a person as your first love instead of God, and you weren't built that way. You weren't designed that way. So the first thing we recognize, if we're going to understand the truth and lies, is that my heart every day is pumping out a lie. You can do this on your own. You don't need God, and I believe it because I go chasing all kinds of things of this world to try to find a sense of fulfillment. And John says, the world and its desires pass away. It does not last. It's a lie that you're living. Okay? What about the other lies? Well, there are people who will lie to us. There are people who will try to lead us astray. John says as much. Versus uh, those, that section of 18 through 27. John says, who is the liar? It is... This is strong language, I know. It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. Now, I know you were all hoping today would be the day that we preach on the Antichrist, right? And he's talking about the Antichrist. Yeah, Antichrist, fantastic. John uses that, if you noticed in his, in his wording, two different ways. He says in a very specific way about a specific person that's to come. He said, you've heard the Antichrist is coming. But actually, he says, I want to talk about antichrists who are already here. And remember, he's writing this 2,000 years ago. He's saying they're already here. There are antichrists actually all over the place. Notice the wording that he uses here. He says, anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ is antichrist. So in this sense, he's using it in the broadest general way. Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the true ruler over all, anyone who denies that, rejects Jesus as the Christ, is the Antichrist. And I know some of you were saying, you know what, for years, I suspected that my neighbor might be the Antichrist. And now I have biblical reasons to believe that that's true. And right away, John would say, that could be. If your neighbor denies that Jesus is the Christ, he's antichrist. But guess what? That means every one of us, before we came to Christ, before we were in Christ, before we accepted Christ, we were all antichrists. That's what he's saying. You and I are antichrists against Jesus as Lord and Savior, King of my life, Whenever I say, no, Jesus, I, I like you, I like what you did for me, but I don't want you running my life. Antichrist. John's saying they're all over the place. It's happening even now. If we're not lying to ourselves, someone else is lying to us and trying to lead us astray. I, I take a deep breath here because <laughs> I know in our culture, this is extremely difficult to hear. To hear John say, look, if you don't believe Jesus is the Christ, you're a liar, you're antichrist. Our culture right now, I know this, I feel it, I talk with my own kids, I talk with others, and, and, and this is it's just so prevalent. People are like, that is so, I cannot believe how narrow-minded that is. That is the most bigoted, narrow-minded statement I've ever heard. If you don't believe Jesus is the Christ, you're a liar and an antichrist. I can't, oh man, that hurts my ears, our culture says. It's so, we live in a pluralistic, multicultural setting. You can't have that kind of statement, Cliff. That stuff is, that just is so, so narrow. It's too exclusive. And, and I, I understand what is behind that when people are like, oh man, you, you can't be so narrow. But let me ask you the question, what is the alternative if we're talking about what's true, what is the alternative? Now, some people say, I'll tell you the alternative. The, the alternative, first of all, don't go around saying people are antichrist because they don't believe in Christ. But I think maybe, Cliff, the answer, one answer that our culture would give us is this. 
It's not about whether, whether you believe in Jesus. So many people haven't even heard of Jesus. How about this? This is more equal. This isn't so exclusive. Good people go to heaven. Bad people go to hell. Now that, that's equal. That's not exclusive. That's not narrow. And I say to that, I could not, no, I, that's almost the most narrow position you could hold. You know why? You have just excluded me. I'll just tell you right now. If it's good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell, well then I'm out. I guess I'm excluded. They're like, oh no, no, no. We're going to grade on a curve, Cliff, so you're going to be just fine. You don't have to worry about that. We're, it's not that difficult. I'm like, no, no. I've become more and more aware I'm not nearly as good as I try to present myself to be. If you're saying that it's equal because, oh, good people go to heaven, you are excluding everyone who knows that they aren't good. You've just become exclusive in your claim. Good people go, bad people don't. And, in fact, I would argue you're more exclusive for this reason. To be good means you have to what? You have to, be, you have to try really, to be morally really good. You have to give a lot of effort. And that means, in that moment, you've just said, so all these other people can't. If you're really bad, there ain't no way, even on a curve, that you're going to make it. If you have really messed up in your life, ain't no way that you're going to make it. What does the gospel say, though? The gospel, which sounds so narrow, only Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said it. Don't blame us. We're just telling you what Jesus said. But when he says that, it sounds so narrow, but guess what he says then? But whosoever believes. That is the broadest possible inclusion. It says it doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how off track you've been. Whosoever will can be saved. That's not narrow. That's all inclusive. Anyone can have faith in Christ. Now there's one other way that I think our culture will argue that's too narrow. I have a solution, Cliff, and here's the solution. It's not the good people go to heaven and the bad people don't. It's that actually all the religions are saying the same thing. They just don't know it. All roads lead to heaven. All paths lead to God. So it really doesn't matter if somebody's a Hindu, someone's uh, you know, a Muslim, someone's a Christian. You guys, don't you see? We'll be, we'll be inclusive. Everybody, all your paths are leading to heaven, and it's the most inclusive, non-exclusive position possible. And I want to tell you, it is one of the most arrogant, exclusive positions possible for this reason. When someone says, look, I know if you took a Christian and a Muslim, and you put them two honest Christ people, an honest Christian and an honest Muslim, and you ask them, describe your faith, describe your faith, are there any real differences between your two faiths? Both the Christian and the Muslim would say, yes, absolutely. Man, these Christians believe that God came in the flesh. That's, that's desecrating to God. God is the other. He's transcendent. He, the Christians believe that. We have a real disagreement between Christians and our view of how God is in that particular way. And the person who says, no, let me be all-inclusive, is basically saying... See, you guys just can't see what I can see. I, I'm kind of above all that, and I'm just saying that your two views are really the same thing. They lead to the same path. Can you come up with a more arrogant position than to say to all of the major world face in the world, you guys don't know your own religion. I know it because I can see above it. It is the most arrogant position to say all faiths lead to, we'll wipe over all the differences. You are actually doing violence to someone's belief when you say you don't really know that your path is the exact same path as this one. It is the most arrogant, exclusive position. And again, we come back to the gospel. We say, no, Jesus said he's the only way. He says he is the Christ. He is the true king, none other. But he says all may come to him and receive forgiveness. And so these are the positions that the culture would say, you can't have truth if it's not for everybody. We'll try to make it for everybody, and Jesus has already done it for everybody. Already inclusive. Now, it doesn't mean that we take this truth with arrogance. First Peter says it very clearly. 
have a reason for the faith that you have. Make sure you're ready to give the reasons for the hope that you have in Christ, but do this with gentleness and respect. Do not be a jerk for Jesus, okay? Ah, we got the truth. It's Jesus. It says right here, you're an antichrist. I'm going to let you know it. You are the antichrist. Do it with gentleness and respect. You can absolutely respect a person of a different faith and say, look, what you see and, and what I see are two different things. I'm, I just want you to know, I believe Jesus is the truth. I want you to know him, not just here. I want you to know him in experience. And to do that with gentleness and respect, you can absolutely do that, church, and we have to do that. We can't hunker down and say, well, it's a scary world out there. John says, no, you can know the truth, and you must share it with gentleness and respect, but with a firmness with a solidness to it that says, I cannot compromise on the one thing that Jesus s consistently says, he is the only way. But how can I really know it? Let me close with this. When you look at these, and John uses these great phrases. He's different than these other writers. I love John for this reason. He could say it much more straightforwardly, but it, I think he gives us a good flavor here. Verses 19 and 27. How can I know the truth? not just in an argument in my head, not just in apologetical ways as I argue with other people about their faith, but how can I know the truth by experience? And he says, this is how you can know. You have an anointing from the Holy One. What are you talking about, John? An anointing from the Holy One. And all of you who have this anointing know the truth. The anointing you receive from him remains in you and you do not need anyone to teach you. He says there's within you. That's why we say, do not believe it because Pastor Cliff is up here preaching. Do not believe it because your spouse says it's true. Yes, listen. Yes, be intrigued. Be engaged by what we say. But ultimately, you can know the truth because you can have the Holy Spirit. And I believe this is what John is referencing. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You have the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in you. You have actually truth himself who lives within you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. He's not saying don't be taught by other people. He's saying, don't you realize what you have within you? They have the truth of God himself living within you. Someone has said, the Holy Spirit is sort of like your pituitary gland. You, you know it's there. You're glad you've got it. You don't want to lose it, but you're not exactly sure what it does. So how in the world can the Holy Spirit living in me give me great confidence and knowledge that I'm in the truth. And it's, it's sort of like this. Let me just read a couple of verses here. And I would encourage you this. If you really want to know the truth about the Holy Spirit anointing on you, the Holy Spirit living in you, read John, Gospel of John, chapters 14, 15, and 16. And I'm just going to read a few verses because Jesus speaks so powerfully and intimately about, don't you realize who's living in you? Let me tell you, fellas. He tells his disciples this. John 14, 16, and 17. I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Jesus is our advocate, but so is the Holy Spirit, to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Later on in that same chapter, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Then you go over to chapter 15. When the advocate, the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And then he says, I'm telling you all this, John chapter 16, so that you will not fall away. You will not be led astray. You will not leave the fellowship of Christ's body. That you will be firm in the truth. You will hold fast and remain in the truth. And then the last one here, this is the one I'll close with. When he, the spirit, this is John 16, 13. When the, he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. It's a very active phrase here. It's a way in which he's saying it's, it's present. It's not one-time deposit, but it's this ongoing walk with him. He will guide you into all truth. And years ago, when I would try to understand this for myself or preach it, I would think about the Holy Spirit this way. If someone says to you, let me give you directions to get somewhere, to be a guide. I'll give you directions. They might give you verbal directions. They might even write it down. 
you're going to go five miles out here, you're going to turn where that old barn used to be, you know, and then you're going to go left or a couple miles, and then you're going to, and they would tell you, and you got to, okay, I got that, but I got to remember it. I got to follow it correctly, which means all of the weight of it kind of falls on you. And I used to say, that's sort of like trying to do it on your own, find truth on your own. But what if the person who was giving you those directions finally just said, oh, forget that. Let me just get in the car with you. And I used to think, that's kind of like how the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit gets in the car with you, and now the person is directing you, saying, hey, in just a couple miles, you're going to turn right up here. Don't miss this turn. And then you're going to turn left. You're going to go. And it's like, that's how the Holy Spirit, and I, I thought that was a great example until Google Maps came along, right? <laughs> because that's what Google Maps does, right? You don't need anybody except Google Maps, bum, 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 and it will talk to you. In a quarter mile, you're going to turn left. You're going to have two lefts. Make sure you take the hard left or take the short left. You know, and it's like, wow, this thing completely does it for you. I say that because when Laura and I went on our sabbatical, I said we, we went to a very remote area of northeastern Oregon. It was so remote, I knew by reading up ahead of time, we were not going to have any cell coverage at all, no, no cell signals because we were going to be down in these deep canyons. It's actually part of what they call Hell's Canyon. Pastor Cliff went to Hell's Canyon for sabbatical. <laughs> That's where he went. But really, really, you know, we had to drive 50 miles to get a cell signal from where we stayed. So to get there for the first time, I knew, and I don't know if you know this, little tip, Google Maps, if you're going somewhere where you can't get a cell signal, you can download the map ahead of time. It actually downloads to your phone so that even without a cell signal, it will still tell you, and you're going to turn right here in a couple miles, blah, blah, blah. So I punched this in, Troy, Oregon, nobody knows where that is, but Google, it's like, I can get you there, no problem. And so this Google Maps is showing me where I'm going, and there's this road, and it's really squiggly. It's most roads, you're like straight, this one is this really back and forth road. It's because we're going to descend into this canyon about 3,000 feet from the top to the bottom. And the only way to get down there is not with paved roads. It's going to be dirt roads that are so narrow, one car only, and when you get to a switchback, because it's a sheer drop off of these switchbacks, you know, you've got to go about 10, 15 miles at the most to try to make this turn. I told you before, I, I took the best vehicle. It's a minivan. I mean, who wouldn't want a minivan in this situation? And we're going, and, and we get into this, and you realize, wow, this is, this is scary stuff because there's no guardrails. There's, it's a dirt road, and, and my tires are right on the edge of instant death if we were to go over. And for me, it was like, okay, this is a little scary, but for my wife, Laura, she has a tremendous fear of heights. And she had, on our way in, she had absolute panic attacks. She was hyperventilating. I'm, I'm holding onto the wheel, we're coming down, and when you're coming down on a dirt road with a switchback right here so you can't see anything over the edge, you know it just drops straight off and you feel your anti-lock brakes beginning to pump as you're sliding down a dirt road towards the switchback. And Laura is absolutely panicked. And I knew, I, what I, I'm like, God, what can I do? If I stop, if I open my car door, if I stop the car and open my car door, I would actually step out right off the edge. I can't stop. I'm praying, Laura's praying, and she is absolutely petrified. About halfway through, God really, really helped her. Because about halfway through, she felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, look, first thing, don't look down. <laughs> look up, right? But focus on me. Focus on who I am. And Laura is, for all she's worth, she is praying. And, and it was worse with her eyes closed, so she kept her eyes open. And, and she's praying, and it began to just, she felt a, pa a calm come over her. We're going down these switchbacks. I'm still nervous, you know, but she's doing a lot better. And we get all the way there. And it's true, we get all the way to Troy. We made it. Google was true. It got us to where we wanted to go. But I want to tell you something. Google can give you the truth of how to get there, but only the Holy Spirit can guide you in that truth and give you peace where you had no peace. See, you can do a Google search on anything and find out the answer, can't you? Google can tell you in an instant the unemployment rate. And Google can tell you in an instant what you should do to have a good resume and how you can have a good interview. But only the Holy Spirit can guide you into that truth when you have lost your job and you have no idea how you're going to pay the next bill. 
And only the Holy Spirit can guide you into that truth where suddenly he begins to say, God will provide. God is going to provide for your need. Even though you can't see it now, God is a God of provision. And he loves you and he cares about you. Google can give you all kinds of information about those sorts of things. You can go to Google and find out all that you need to know about eating disorders and addictive behavior. And they can give you statistics. They can tell you what the trends are. They can even tell you, hey, these are some good things to try. But I can tell you this, Google can't do this, but only the Holy Spirit can guide you into that truth when you have been battling this your whole life and you fail once again and you say, I am worthless. I have nothing in my life that's good. I can't overcome this. And in that moment, only the Holy Spirit can guide you to say, you are deeply loved as you are, not as you think you should be. Google can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit can guide you into truth. Only the Holy Spirit, you can go to Google and you can find out divorce rates. You can find out all that's legally necessary that's going to have to happen for that divorce to take place. But I can tell you this, only the Holy Spirit can guide you through that most painful, difficult truth in your life and say, you will come through this because I'm going to carry you. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Google can tell you all about cancer, all the statistics, all of the survival rates, all of the treatments, but only the Holy Spirit can guide you into that most difficult truth and say, whether by my life or my death, God will be glorified and give you grace to sustain you. Google can tell you about mortality rates, but Google can't help you a lick when it comes to losing a loved one. And you look at that pain and that grief, and only the Holy Spirit can guide you into that truth and say, oh, let me give you the hope of the resurrection. Let me give you a real hope in the face of this grief. And yes, you will grieve, but with a hope that is so profound, it rocks the world when they see someone who is not absolutely stiffened to death by the thought of death. Only the Holy Spirit can guide us into all truth. Do you see why John is saying, look, this is not about more facts and information. This is about actually living life with God who lives in you if you're willing to surrender to the only king. But if you resist this king, if you say, I will not have you ruling my life, you will never have this anointing. But for whosoever will, you can have him, he will be in you, and he will guide you into whatever truth you have to face. This is the God that we worship and we proclaim today. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful <clears throat> because of you. Yes, you do great things for us. But what really stirs our hearts is the knowledge of your character, of who you really are, your love for us. God, as we think about you ruling our lives as the only true king, we pray that you would help us to overcome lies from within the lies of our own sinful nature that does not trust you, simply does not trust you. God, we, we pull that out, we, we lay that before you, we confess it, we ask you to kill that part of us so that your life in us would come through even more. God, we pray that we would be aware of those who don't trust in you as Messiah King and would lead us astray with thoughts that there may be more than what you can provide, something else. God, we pray that we would have compassion, respect, honor for them, but also a firmness to stand in your truth because, God, we love them and we want the very best for them and that can only happen in you. So, God, help us to know the truth, painful as it is many times, but your grace is more than sufficient. We trust in you and we call out to you now and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to close with uh, this song, but we also have something after the song. This is a great celebration today because we're going to uh, baptize Crosby Seifert, and um, so I'm going to have Crosby come up. And uh, So after the song, we're going to uh, have a baptism. So after we sing, would you please be seated and just wait so that we can celebrate together. Um, if you have a prayer need, though, 
Uh, Pastor Dave's going to be available. Please go on out and visit with him while people are singing, and then uh, we'll celebrate this baptism together. Let's stand. Let's worship God today. gets old um, to see the Holy Spirit move a heart. Um, we've got uh, Crosby Seifert here, and she is requested um, to be baptized. And we know that that is so significant because she has a desire in her to obey Jesus, his command, which was to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For us, um, as a church, baptism is a sign Baptism itself, we don't believe, saves anyone. Only Christ does that. But the sign is important. It has power to it as the Holy Spirit works it. And we pray the Holy Spirit works it big time for Crosby today. So we only have one requirement um, for baptism. Um, it's not about an age requirement. It's not a height requirement. Um, it only has to do with a person's heart. And so, Crosby, I'm going to ask you this question. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, that's an excellent, excellent question. Crosby believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and she's putting her trust in him. And there's going to be lots to come in your life with Jesus, but this is a big day to celebrate. And so it's entirely appropriate that we baptize you. So I'm going to ask you to turn this way. Crosby, I baptize you. love to pray in this moment because our, our prayer is that God's going to seal this moment in her life. She can always look back and she can say, I know I'm in Christ. I know I'm in Christ. God gave me this sign as a reminder. So let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for Crosby for her confession of faith, which is never easy to do, but she was able to say she's not ashamed of you and to say it out loud. So God, we give thanks for how you've worked that into her life. And we pray for her, Lord. We pray for her on this day that this moment would be something you bring back to her in the dark times, in the difficult times, 
that you would remind her that she belongs to you. And God, you never lose those who are in your hand. And so we pray uh, that you would hold her close. We pray, God, in the days and the years to come that you would supply for her in every way. We pray, God, that you would protect her in spiritual battles and fights that are to come, and that you would give her great strength to be a witness for you no matter where she is. We pray, God, um, that you would bless uh, her family, um, and we give great thanks um, that we're able to celebrate with her this day. Be with her. May your Holy Spirit continue to dwell in her and give her strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good job. You're dismissed.